uh, uh, welcome you to the second session of this uh, workshop on mathematics of CI and I sit. And the first speaker is uh, Professor Luke Bennett. And uh, the title of his talk in Ocean Wave Propagation in the Marginalization and the transition from consolidated to broken ice covers. I request Professor Bennett to start his presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Sahu. Um, unless anyone stops me, I'm going to presume you can all hear me okay and uh, you can uh, see yeah, my slides okay. full screen. Uh, so first thing to say is uh, thanks very much to Mike and Suzanne for organising this. Uh, next thing is um, that this is work. We, uh, hey, Luke, just to, sorry to interrupt you. We, we can see your view, which shows this slide, oh. presenter notes and next slide. Right. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. Uh, ba, 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 ba. How do I saw that out? Uh, I've got two screens here, so I thought... Um, so we default to the full screen. Uh, new share. How's that, Mike? Yeah, that's perfect. All right. Good. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, got me off in my stride there, but um, yeah, it would have been embarrassing otherwise. Okay. So look, um. This um, this work I'm going to present is motivated by some lab experiments I was involved in uh, a, a good few years ago. Um, so the the experiments were conducted in uh, a large ice tank in Finland, Alto University, uh, and what you're seeing here is a view of the tank. I'm about to show you a movie of one of the tests that we conducted. So that white stuff that you're seeing is model sea ice. It's about three centimeters thick. Uh, and over many, many hours, uh, that was growing by the team across the water surface of the tank, right? So the tank is um, 30 to 40 meters wide and, and um, the, the, the same in breadth, uh, um, in length as well. Uh, and then we removed uh, 10 meters of the ice away from the wave maker. So the wave maker is at the far end of the tank from your view at the moment uh, and uh, removed it from the size of the wall as well. Uh, and then we started sending in waves and uh, we recorded both the response of the ice and uh, the wave propagation through the ice. Now, these were fantastically complicated and expensive um, tests to conduct. We only got three tests in there. Um, I think they worked out really well. But our philosophy for the tests was that we started out with really small waves. And each time we um, changed the test, we increased the amplitudes of the waves. So we made the waves more energetic. And uh, the real motivation was to, to study the breakup of the ice. So the, the first waves that we sent in, were small enough that it didn't break the ice cover. Then the next waves partially broke up the ice cover uh, and the final waves just broke it all up very quickly. And um, we analyzed pretty much everything and, and very quickly the, the the ice flows got to be about a quarter of the wavelengths. I can hear myself. I think someone needs to mute. Um, and I'm gonna just show you a video of the intermediate test. This is the partial breakup test. Right, that was horribly noisy for me. I'm sorry about that <laughs> and a few tech issues today. Um, but what you should have seen a little bit of was the waves propagating through the ice cover, bending and flexing the ice cover uh, and leaving some broken flows uh, behind some breaking front. Uh, I'm motivated about the, the findings that we had concerning uh, the, the waves in the ice cover. So um, at the beginning of the test, uh, this is a schematic of what we had. It's not to scale at all. Remember, the ice cover is only a few centimeters thick. The water is a couple of meters deep. So I'm referring to it as consolidated ice cover. Then uh, at the end of the test, the ice cover is all broken up. And uh, here's my schematic of what that looks like. 
underneath the ice cover, we had a line of pressure sensors. And from that, we could get the properties of the waves. So they were in, we had five of them. They were in a line of increasing distance away from the initial ice edge. So here's what we got from the first test where the ice stayed consolidated. Uh, you can take these to be the, the wave heights, they're normalized against the instant wave heights. So that when it's one, that is giving you the, um, the instant wave. But what you can see here is that we have a gradual reduction in the wave height through the ice cover. That won't be a surprise to pretty much everyone here. That's um, wave attenuation as the waves propagate through the ice cover. The thing that I want to point out and that's uh, really motivated what I'll present to you is uh, this big drop uh, at the first measurement point in the ice cover. So I'm going to refer to that as an amplitude drop. So if I go to the corresponding results uh, in the, the later test, then note that that amplitude drop disappears. Now, if you've got sharp eyes and you look at the attenuation, uh, you should see that the attenuation when the ice cover is broken up is actually stronger than in the consolidated case. So the, the main message that I took from these tests is that rather than just considering wave attenuation, which is what most of us do in this field, we should also consider an amplitude drop. Now, uh, just to get your expectations low enough for the, the, the maths I'm about to present to you, I'm not going to try to exactly replicate what went on during the lab experiments. I'm really going to be thinking about snapshots of what the ice cover looks like at the beginning of the test and what it looks like at the end of the test and the way, way that uh, waves propagate through those two different types of ice cover. Uh, so um, here's the, the schematic that you saw for the consolidated ice cover. And now this is going to represent my mathematical model. And um, yeah, I'm starting with consolidated ice cover because that's the, the simplest case. So I'm um, just defining my geometry here. Uh, and, and the model is the one that um, most of us use. Uh, I'm using potential flow theory for the water. Uh, I'm treating the seabed as an impermeable solid. And you know, maybe, maybe the slight difference to um, uh, what some people do, I'm, I'm treating the ice cover as a viscoelastic plate rather than just an elastic plate, although uh, it's not particularly novel. Uh, and um, as represented by the schematic, the problem is 2D, and we're going to make standard assumptions that we have linear motions and uh, we've mapped the frequency domain. Um, so we're treating um, time harmonic motions, and uh, that means that we're going to consider complex valued unknowns. So the, the only unknown that I present you with is the velocity potential phi. So that satisfies Laplace's equation in the water, uh, Neumann condition on the seabed. Uh, and then um, some plate equation uh, given to you in terms of the velocity potential forced by the... the uh, fluid loading uh, beneath the ice cover. Okay, so that's this complicated equation here, uh, familiar to lots of you. The one part I want to highlight here uh, it is this term with the imaginary unit in front of it. This is the viscous part. So I've made the choice to use the, the Robinson Palmer damping model. Um, there are lots of different options for your, your, um, uh, your damping model. It doesn't even have to be uh, viscous damping. I've gone for the Robinson Palmer because it gives, well, it's about the only model that I know of that um, gives the, the a correct power law attenuation. And um, I, I won't use any that don't give the correct power law, but it is going to have an effect on the findings that I'll present later. And of course, if you drop the ice terms, then you get back to standard free surface condition, which holds in the open water on the left-hand side. So now I'm going to decompose the geometry into the open water on the left, the ice-covered water on the right. Uh, and I'll just give you the, the regular eigenfunction expansion. So firstly, in the open water. Um, so 
here is the propagating part with wave number K0, which is related to an open water wavelength lambda W. Uh, and then these are all the evanescent terms. And on the right-hand side, we have something similar. Uh, it's just that we have different wave numbers, kappa noughts and kappa ends for the um, uh, for the um, the evanescent modes, um, and of course we get an extra two modes here, which comes from the presence of the plate. Um, but the main thing to take from here is that uh, kappa naught is now complex valued because of the viscosity, so it's related to a wavelength uh, in the ice covered water lambda zero and also an attenuation rate alpha zero. And then to solve the problem, you just have to match at the interface. And uh, from that, you get a linear system and you find the, the amplitude A's um, in the ice-covered region and uh, the reflected amplitude, the R's in the open water region. I won't go into any more details about that. What I want to show you is some results. So I've just picked uh, an instant wave in terms of a wavelength up here. Uh, and I'm showing you the solution that we get at the bottom here. So the, the blue, um, that's the, the wave elevation in the open water to the left of the ice cover. You can pretty much ignore that. The CN is the important part. That's the displacement of the ice. Now imagine that you don't know anything about the, the solution itself. I just give you this displacement and ask you about its properties. Well, the first thing you might take from it uh, is a wavelength lambda, okay? And uh, as you might expect, that wavelength uh, is equal to the, uh, the lambda zero that we would have got from the, the kappa zero wave number in the ice covered water. And then you might think to fit an exponential curve to the envelope of the displacement. Uh, and so you can express that using an amplitude A and an attenuation rate alpha. And unsurprisingly, the alpha is equal to alpha zero and the A is equal to A zero. Just notice there's that little bit of discrepancy at the ice edge. That's just the evanescent part of the solution which dies out very quickly. Now I'm going to break the ice cover. I'll just do it once, for example. Uh, in terms of the solution method, then you just have to um, consider uh, some additional modes. You have some uh, leftward going modes, either propagating or decaying or both, uh, as well as the rightward going ones. And you've got to do that every time you break the ice cover right into a separate ice flow. But then you can turn the handle, do basically the same thing. You can set up a linear system, you can solve for the unknown amplitudes. Um, I do this in a recursive fashion. It's not particularly important for this presentation, apart from the fact that it is efficient and that allows me to solve from lots and lots of times, for lots and lots of breakages, uh, which is actually really important to get out some results at the end. So here's the, the solution, same instant wavelength. And the important part here is that where there's a break in the ice cover, you get a discontinuity in the displacement of the, of the ice. Uh, so that's wave scattering coming into play. Uh, so in order to analyze the displacement, really you need to divide it according to the breakage. So you can still fit your exponential curves to each one, but that doesn't give you a global attenuation rate. But now I just continue to break up the ice cover. I just keep on going until the ice flow is really, really small. I hope the image here is clear. Remember, it's not to scale, okay? So the ice is not really this thick. Um, but the important thing is that I've broken up lots and lots of times. It looks a bit like a metamaterial here, doesn't it? But it, it's not, it just uh, flows at much smaller than the wavelengths. And if you do that, almost magically, it might seem, uh, you get back to the sort of displacement field that you got when the ice was consolidated. It's a regular decaying wave. Um, so that means that if I just gave you this, uh, you can tell me about the displacement in terms of uh, the wavelength lambda, uh, the amplitude A and the attenuation rate alpha. Uh, the important thing here though is that the, the lambda is not equal to lambda zero, the alpha is not equal to alpha zero, and the A is not equal to A zero, okay? 
but overall, this is just telling us that um, uh, we've reached a homogenized regime. Um, it's really just the continuum hypothesis coming into play. So now I need to talk you through these results a little bit. What we've done here is that we have parameterized the breakage in terms of a mean flow length, which I'm calling L, okay? So for each point along the abscissa here, um, we have a mean flow length. We randomly generate the ice cover so that it has the correct mean flow length. And then we solve for the wave field and we analyze that wave field and we do it lots and lots of times for each mean uh, length, we calculate a large ensemble and we look at the statistical properties. And from that, we pick out on the top here, the wavelength lambda, then the attenuation rate alpha, and then the amplitude A. Uh, and then we do it across uh, a range of different mean flow lengths. Uh, and so that's what you're seeing here. And note that, um, in all cases, we get a plateau for small mean flow lengths here, here, and here, and for very large flow lengths up here, here, and here, okay? Uh, and also I'm showing you the open water wavelength, uh, lambda W for reference. Uh, so if I go to the plateau for large flow lengths, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, uh, the, the values that they plateau to come from the unbroken consolidated ice cover. Someone just tell me, can you see the images of all of our faces here? Or can you actually see the, can you see the- We can see it perfectly. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So it's just my screen, which is a little bit off. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so I'm calling that the consolidated ice regime. That's from about um, 10 wavelengths uh, in terms of mean flow lengths, uh, mean flow length and larger. And there, it really doesn't matter what the random realization of your ice cover is, you'll always get the same solution. Then we have a transition regime in the middle where the, um, uh, the values of lambda, alpha, and A depend on the mean flow length. And um, you really have to do some statistical analysis there. I won't go into the details because it's quite cumbersome, but um, you know, if you do it correctly, then you can come out with um, some, some meaningful statistics. But then for about um, L is uh, la um, the innocent wavelength on 10 and lower, we plateau again. Uh, and I'll refer to that as the fully broken regime. But there we don't actually know what the, the limiting values are. So that is the challenge. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to look for those limiting values by first making the assumption that all of the flow lengths are the same. And just like in the consolidated regime, uh, from the, the numerical results, it really doesn't matter what the random realization of the ice cover is, you always get the same solution. Okay, so I have identical flow lengths. I'm gonna cover all of the water surface with them. I'm not gonna worry about the, the scattering of the instant wave at the ice edge. I just wanna know the properties of the ice cover. Because it's now a periodic problem, I can reduce it down to a unicell, just one flow. And then mathematically, I'll close the problem using Bloch's theory, which means that the solution on the right is related to the solution on the left in terms of uh, a phase change plus a modulation, which I represent in terms of this Bloch wave number Q. Now this acts like, well, I'll treat this Q as something like an eigenvalue for the problem that I need to go and find. So the way I solve that problem is uh, I add some hypothetical scattering problem for the unit cell. I need to calculate a reflection R and a transmission T. Once I've done that, uh, I, um, I construct this transfer matrix, which tells me how the field on the right-hand side of the unit cell is related to the field on the left-hand side. I look at the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix and from them, I get all of the admissible block wave numbers, which I'll call Q0, Q1, and so on. It's actually only Q0 that I want. That one is the one that acts like a damped propagating wave, all of the others act like evanescent waves. Okay, but up to this point, I haven't used the, the smallness of the flows. 
So now I'm going to take this representation of the transfer matrix. Now, the way to understand this is imagine that you're standing on the right hand side of the flow in the open water there, right? You're going to go back across the unit cell. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get into the ice cutter. And that's represented by this non-square matrix VR, right? So that takes you from open water into the ice cover. Then you're going to move from the right-hand side of the ice cover to the left-hand side. So that is just a phase change plus a modulation. And that is very simple. It's just represented by a diagonal matrix. And then you're just going to undo uh, what you did on the right-hand side with another uh, non-square matrix VL to take you back into the open water. Now, the important thing here is that the dependence on the length of the flow is only contained in this diagonal matrix. I'm going to apply Taylor's theorem to it. And I'm going to get something like this. Uh, the first term uh, I can simplify to the identity matrix because VR and VL are like pseudo inverses of one another. Uh, and then it's this first order matrix that I'm interested in. And I'm going to compare that to a direct diagonalization of the transfer matrix. Okay, so now the L dependence is in a number of different places in the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But if I imagine that I have some limits of those, which I'll denote with the subscript Bs, then I can do something similar using Taylor's theorem. And then I'm just going to compare those two matrices in red. And that tells me that I can get the limiting values of um, uh, the block wave numbers, which I'm really after, from the spectrum of that matrix P1, which doesn't depend on L. All right, so here are the results, right? These uh, symbols are the results from a couple of slides ago, but I'm just focusing in on the fully broken regime and just above it. Uh, so this is the, the wavelength, the attenuation rate, and amplitude. Uh, the blue line is um, the, the straight block theory, and the, the broken CN line is that broken limit from the previous slide. Uh, I haven't told you how I get uh, the amplitude A, but it really just um, means taking those limited values and putting them back into the scattering problem. Uh, and what you can see here is that I get a really nice agreement if I get into the fully broken regime, I'm picking up that fully broken limit. And on the bottom here, I'll just to emphasize this is all working nicely. Uh, the blue curve is a direct numerical simulation for a small flow size, L is equal to one, uh, randomly generated realization of the ice cover. And then I've reconstructed the wave field uh, with all those limiting values that I picked up and the agreement is essentially perfect. I'm basically out of time, but this is just really the icing on the cake. I can now do this for all different frequencies and um, I can construct uh, dispersion curves from here, but I think I might just skip this for the sake of time. Professor Sahu, how long have I got? Am I out of time already? I can't hear you. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay, yeah. you're right. That's probably not enough to go through this in detail. So. I'll just let someone ask me about it if we run out of questions. Um, uh, so um, to summarize what I've shown you, okay, so I started out with those lab experiments and uh, I picked out in particular that uh, the measurements of the waves in the ice uh, before and after uh, breakup of the ice cover occurred showed that we have both attenuation of waves as they propagate through the ice cover, right, which is the standard thing that one looks at, but also this amplitude drop at the ice edge when the ice is consolidated. I then set up a mathematical model uh, where I controlled the amount of breakage of the ice cover, right? and I looked at the properties of the waves as they um, uh, uh, travel into and then through the ice cover. And I showed that um, we've got the increased attenuation uh, as the ice cover breaks up and also the decrease in the amplitude drop as the ice cover breaks up. Uh, we found two different limits, a consolidated limit when the flow sizes are large and uh, we got those from just the classic model. This is basically Fox and Squire 1991 plus some viscosity. Uh, and I also showed that there's a fully broken limit, and that's where we did some new mathematical analysis using block theory and um, uh, Taylor's theorem in order to derive the limiting values. 
Uh, between those two, we have a transition regime. I didn't speak a great deal about that, but um, that's scattering dominated. Uh, and it means that you really have to treat it in a statistical fashion and interpret uh, the values that uh, you extract in, in a statistical fashion as well, right? Because the, the wave field depends on the particular realization of the ice cover. Uh, so Jun and I uh, submitted this work last week. Uh, it's on the archive. If uh, anyone wants to go and find it, please do, or just email me and I'll send it to you. Uh, and just a couple of things on our to-do list. Well, the, the first one is, is fairly obvious, is to uh, look at different concentrations or all this 100% uh, ice concentration at the moment, and we've all just set uh, approximately one meter ice thickness. So um, it should be straightforward to do, but it might turn up something interesting. Uh, the real question that's on my mind is whether the, the fully broken limit um, uh, is the, the mass loaded model that a lot of us will know. Well, actually, I think I know the answer to that. And most of the time it's very close to that, but it's not actually the mass loaded model because the, the edges of the, the ice flows, albeit very small, they can often generate evanescent waves and you can't replicate those with the mass loaded model, but we need to do, well, there's a little bit in the paper that we've submitted, but um, uh, it's definitely not a full analysis. Okay, that was everything. Um, okay, thank you. Take some questions so and thanks everyone for have, listening. Can we have uh, one or two questions from the audience? Um, I've, I've got a question. I apologize for being here in two different places. Um, just, I, and I posted a picture. I took a picture, Luke, just so you can see what we see, because you're not the only person that had that question. It must be something to do with the way Zoom works, but we saw that perfectly. You can see in the chat there what we saw. Oh, so oh, so that. Some people can see our faces over the... You can see the faces, Stop. but it's always on the side. It doesn't show it over your picture. There's a bit of randomness in Zoom as well, I find. <laughs> yeah, but that's... Yeah, that's right. Someone might have, but any, but uh, someone could have set it wrong on their computer. I'm sure. I um, couple of questions. Why do you think you need when you get so small? Do you need that Robinson Palmer attenuation term because it's not really bending? Yeah. No, no, no. The, the Robinson Palmer is not about bending. This, this is the key point, right? If you put, um. I can't think of the name of the, oh, the models that are used, right? I then the bending saying, would go yeah. and, and the attenuation would would go entirely, okay? There is no um, attenuation due to scattering in the limit. Okay, so um, the ROMs and Palmer doesn't depend on the bending here, and that makes sense. It, and the, the, the key thing is it depends on the wavelength, right? And the wavelength changes because the dispersion changes when you break up the ice cover and the attenuation responds to that. What about, um, and what did you mean when you said you solved it recursively? That just means that you had a big matrix system that you didn't invert. Is that right? Or a sparse matrix system? Uh, uh, Some... I mean, this is, this is the stuff that I've <laughs> been hammering for about 10 years with, with you on quite a few of the papers, Mike. Um, yeah, it, it, it means that um, I essentially solve it left to right. Um, it, it, it's a little more sophisticated than that in order to maintain stability, but it means that the, the, the size of the system that I solve never gets larger than uh, the, the number of modes you have for a particular ice flow. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing is, you know, in order to get those dispersion curves that I kind of skipped over pretty quickly, in the transition regime where you have to do the statistical analysis, every time that you go to a different frequency you've got to generate the ice cover hundreds of times so if you want to do that for lots of different frequencies and lots of different mean uh, ice flow lengths um, then you really need a, a pretty efficient method to get the results out in a reasonable amount of time yeah yeah, yeah and it makes sense yeah, I right. think, uh, yeah thanks very much Luke. yeah I, okay i think we're going to stop here uh...